And now, kicking things off for us, the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, Dan Porterfield. Hello, and welcome to the first day of Aspen Ideas Health. I'm Dan Porterfield, president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. At the Aspen Institute, we drive change toward a free, just, and equitable society. And for the past eight years, Aspen Ideas Health has been central to that calling by helping frame and discuss critical challenges in health in ways that lead to solutions. Now, as hope spreads with each COVID-19 vaccine being administered, the need to share bold approaches that lead to better health has never been great. Over the next three days, we'll explore topics ranging from groundbreaking discoveries in gene editing to solutions for dismantling structural racism and from reimagining the future of healthcare to medical research being done in space. You'll hear from more than 50 leaders, innovators, artists, survivors, astronauts, physicians, curators, advocates, journalists, and scientists who are tackling some of today's most significant health challenges. Of course, we wouldn't be able to bring you these important conversations without the support of our valued underwriters. This year, we are pleased to be presenting Aspen Ideas Health with our media partners at NBC Universal News Group. I want to thank you all for tuning in and for what will be an inspiring and engaging three days of dialogue, performances, and presentations that we hope will leave you with fresh ideas to consider. Now, I'd like to turn it over to your host for the next three days, NBC senior medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. Thank you, Dan, for that introduction. Now, I've had the privilege of participating in past Aspen Ideas health programs, and I'm delighted to be serving as a host for this year's events. And welcome to our audience joining us from all across the country for Aspen Ideas Health 2021, presented by the Aspen Institute in partnership with NBC Universal News Group. It's great to have everyone join us. Before we kick off our program, I want to provide a quick roadmap to help steer you through the next few days. Each day, Aspen Ideas Health will include two sessions. During the first, which we will start momentarily, we will hear from big thinkers and innovative doers on a wide range of health challenges, such as pandemic prevention, brain health, and the ability to amplify public health communication through art. And each afternoon, we invite you to a live deep dive session during which you can actively engage with a panel of experts during a Q&A. There is no separate registration to participate in this live programming. Just check your email for the links and follow the directions on your screen. And each day, Aspen Ideas Health promises to bring you provocative conversations, inspiring performances, and exciting new ideas. We hope you enjoy it all. But we start by exploring the powerful impact of music and the arts on the human brain, particularly their potential as therapy for neurologic-related disorders. World-renowned soprano Renee Fleming and director of the National Institute of Health, Dr. Francis Collins, join in conversation and in song to discuss and demonstrate the connection between music and our brain. I guarantee you will actually feel it. Hello, I'm Renee Fleming. I'm delighted to be joined today by my good friend, Dr. Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Collins is the only presidentially appointed NIH director to serve in three administrations and oversees the work of the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world. He's also noted for his landmark discoveries of disease genes and his leadership of the International Human Genome Project. For the last few years, Francis and I have spearheaded Sound Health, a partnership between the NIH, the Kennedy Center, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Now, many of you may have already heard how this began, a chance dinner party in Washington with three Supreme Court justices, and a lot has happened in the few years since. After Francis and I spoke at last year's Aspen Ideas, Health 2020, about the science of the arts, we wanted to explore today what the road ahead looks like for the arts and health, including some very exciting recent developments. So Francis, with the initial investment from recent NIH grants for music and health research, a true research community is being forged. Can you talk about what this means? Uh, yes, I would love to. And Renee, it's great to join this session with you for Aspen and to have a chance to talk about what's happened in the course of the last year, COVID notwithstanding. One of the things that I found so enlivening about this opportunity to work with you on Sound Health 
is how it inspired a lot of the scientific staff around me uh, to join up. So we have no less than 23 of our institutes that have staff engaged in a trans NIH working group on sound health, really coming up with creative ideas about how we could, using this research engine called NIH, the largest one in the world, come up with additional insights into how, in fact, music intersects uh, with what we're learning about neuroscience and how we could use that information to further enhance the ways that music can be used as a healing effort for people who are struggling with various challenges. So we have now, um, after a lot of thought about how best to do this, funded no less than $20 million worth of research in this area and uh, brought together 15 investigators. And we just had our first meeting of all of them uh, where they could talk to each other about what they're doing. That's pretty amazing. Uh, some of these are fairly basic studies looking at music and how it affects early development of the brain. Uh, some of them are more on the neuroscience, trying to understand how musical sounds uh, are interpreted in the auditory cortex and how that translates into emotional impact that we can all remember having uh, the experience of, or for some of us, it seems to happen a lot. And then especially uh, research that's looking at music and how it can be applied for healing, how it is that we could utilize music to help somebody who's struggling with PTSD or how we could use rhythm uh, to help in the case of Parkinson's disease, where that rhythm may help somebody overcome what is otherwise a motor difficulty. Uh, those 15 investigators all presented what they were up to, and uh, it was inspiring uh, to see. And you could also see the way in which the interactions <clears throat> between these folks, many of whom didn't really work together before, are gonna make the whole even greater than the sum of the parts. So we're on a roll here, uh, putting together <laughs> such a program, and this is just the beginning. Yes, I was so thrilled to hear at least a little bit, these short presentations on all of the work that they're doing. Very Indeed. exciting work. Um, schizophrenia, for instance, that, you know, to begin to understand how, how this recognition of reality can be perhaps uh, strengthened through yes. songwriting yes. in a group. Isn't that I mean, an amazing example? Absolutely. We're also excited, Renee, to be developing, though, a toolkit for music-based interventions for researchers who are studying disorders of aging and how music can help with that. And your foundation has been very important uh, to our putting together this kind of a plan. What we'd like to do is to provide through this toolkit a clear sense of what researchers would want to be doing as far as design of studies so that we could learn as much as possible in a rigorous way about what works and what doesn't work in terms of offering musical interventions uh, to people who have disorders of aging. So yeah, say something about this one because your foundation has got very engaged with the foundation for NIH and making this happen. Well, I'm so thrilled that the Renee Fleming Foundation can partner on this toolkit with the NIH and the FNIH. So looking to build out the evidence base for music and health interventions is so important when we think about what we could achieve uh, nationwide with the right body of research. And creating the toolkit, I think uh, it was something that I understood from the beginning was, was something necessary because um, the nature of research is so important. And if, if it's not condoned by the NIH, then it's almost as if it doesn't really have the possibility for having a great impact uh, in a sense. And we know that there's a ton of research out there that's been done for decades. And so we want to build on that and shore it up. Um, and behavioral science and statistics can be drawn on for figuring out exactly how the toolkit can develop common guidelines. So people would be able to go to the NIH and say, oh, okay, not only has someone already done this, which is also important because people weren't speaking to each other early on in, in research quarters, but um, how could we do it so that it is really successful? Um, and investigators can build on each other's data uh, efficiently. And then, of course, I love the fact that it all ends with the NIH saying, yes, we validate this, we're gonna continue to fund it, and that enables us to really begin to think about how we can provide it on a large scale and how we can fund it for people through insurance, et cetera. Yes. So um, this, your, your new body of research is gonna contribute hugely to arts and health, isn't it? 
That's the idea that we're really going to try to assist with the evolution of this field into a new space here uh, where we're going to encourage clear thoughtfulness about design of studies because while there's a great deal of exciting information coming out of music therapy approaches to various conditions, a lot of it still does uh, seem to be more on the anecdotal side than it does on the side of a rigorous, well-designed study that could then be replicated to be sure that it works. And that's, I think, where the field now needs to go. So through this toolkit, figuring out what kind of designs make the most sense, what are the metrics that you use to assess response? What are the investigators and their disciplinary expertise that you ought to have involved in order to be sure that the study is going to give a result that you can be quite confident in? Even what do you use for common data elements, something that we talk about a lot in other areas of medical research, so that you can compare studies across uh, different, different investigators and different kinds of applications and see actually what was similar and what was different. If you didn't measure the same things or call them the same particular elements, uh, then it's pretty hard to do that comparison. We've got the chance because this field now is just bursting with potential to be sure that we align it with all of these principles about good design so that we can learn as much as possible. Now, some people might think that sounds a little heavy handed, like you're going to constrain things. Not at all. We want people to unleash all of the most creative ideas they can come up with, but do so in a framework where we'll understand what happened and how to build on that. It's really the understanding of the brain that's allowed this to happen, the explosion of technology with fMRI, EEG, and um, people are talking about biomarkers all the time now. So when I first became introduced to this field of research, I heard soft science mentioned all the time from, from doctors and various people. Can you speak to that? So what I what is making this uh, into uh, less of a soft science, shall we say? A uh, very good point you're making, because I think that has been a criticism oftentimes in the past. It didn't seem as if it was based upon the sort of rigorous scientific evidence or understanding mechanisms. We are at this remarkable moment in neuroscience uh, where the BRAIN initiative, uh, which has now been supported by NIH uh, for six years and is going to continue in a very exciting way, is really figuring out some fundamentals about how those circuits uh, that involve those 86 billion neurons between your ears do what they do. We're going to really understand how you process auditory information and why it is that music goes to a slightly different part of the auditory cortex uh, than sounds like spoken language and what that means and how does that connect then with other aspects of who you are, especially emotional responses, which we know can be very powerful. Gosh, yeah, it's just recently been Easter morning and Renee, I was uh, of course not able to go to church because nobody can go to church, it's not safe yet. And I'm sitting listening uh, to church service uh, on my laptop and uh, they sang that wonderful opening hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. And they got to the last verse and there was a descant. And descants just do me in every time. <laughs> and I had got chills. I got this sense of being sort of lifted out of myself. I realized that I had tears were streaming down my face. I didn't expect that to happen. And that was because of the power of that music to touch my very soul. Now, that kind of power is something we're increasingly able to understand through the tools of neuroscience. And some people go, might say, oh, you're taking the awe away from it. No, 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 no. <laughs> We're adding awe to it by having the ability to understand the amazing ways that brains can do these things and how we can use those to help people who are suffering. This is really an exciting moment for sure. That's so wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, imagine being able to harness that emotional power and many of us, I mean, I started, my interest in this really be, began with this recognition that the mind-body connection was so crucial for my ability as a singer to become a great singer, uh, and certainly for my ability to communicate with the audience. And there's, there's no question that that affects, if we can affect the body in that respect with involuntary muscles that create a virtuosic style of singing, we can do it with, with various health outcomes. So um, there are other exciting recently launched initiatives that I wanted to talk about too, because uh, there's an explosion of interest in the sector and not just, for, well, from the public as well, which is probably driving it. But the NEA, one of our partners has um, funded the Sound Health Network 
and UCSF, uh, which has been a magnet for arts-related uh, funding and health, uh, is, has be, was chosen actually to create this clearinghouse um, for, uh, as a resource center and a network. So this is a way for all different researchers to connect with each other and for, uh, for the body as a whole to connect with the public, which is so fabulous. It's just starting up. It's a great group of people and um, a real scientists that we admire. And then there's the Neuro Arts Blueprint Initiative. So Ruth Katz and Susan Mag Salmon. Uh, Ruth Katz is, of course, from the Aspen Institute, and Susan Mag Salmon from Johns Hopkins are, are starting this new scientific field of inquiry, art, health, well-being, and humanities. And this, the idea is to create a field, which is a much larger than an initiative, a conference, it's something that's considered to be off to the side. Because when you think about creating a field, it's about something that has real strength underneath that, a foundation, and it joins some of the other great fields. Climate, climate science was, was not a field just a few decades ago. So that's an example. So it's broader than music. It can establish and promote wellness across the humanities, architecture, the study of beauty. Neuro arts is, of course, about how we as human beings engage with artistic uh, elements from top to bottom. So how do results from research impact society as a whole? And what does this mean for how we design arts in health research? Well, that's what we'd love to know the answer to, isn't it? And I kind of think that we have an intermediate step in between these very specific studies that are being conducted by researchers, often on a subset of individuals with a particular condition. So you might have a study that involved a few dozen people, but ultimately you want to know how does this affect uh, larger groups? And in this area, I imagine we have an opportunity that can be invested in, and that is to look at some of these large scale cohorts that NIH has been supporting, some of them for a long time, like the framing study, some of them more recently, like the program called All of Us, uh, which aims to enroll 1 million Americans, and we're already up to almost 400,000. Those folks are our partners. They're very diverse. Uh, they are willing to share information about themselves, their electronic records. Uh, they have their DNA analyzed. And they're very interested in taking part in various kinds of additional studies. So if we come up with ways that we think based on research are likely to be beneficial, either for keeping people healthy or for dealing with some chronic challenge of an illness, here is a place to do that. I also got to mention, we have a study that's ongoing right now that enrolls nine or 10 year olds. So it's called ABCD, the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development, and tracks them over the course of eight years to see what is happening during that very critical time period uh, between uh, childhood and adolescence and adulthood. And this is another place where I think we'd have a great opportunity to see how various musical interventions might help for those that are struggling with a particular issue or who are just trying to stay healthy. So all of those are the kinds of uh, experimental opportunities that we should be thinking about as we take our insights forward. Perfect, yes. Um, and there's a great example of this in the arts and health. Um, Epi Arts Lab at University of Florida, led by Jill Sonke, an NEA research lab collaboration between academia and government, philanthropy, and including Bloomberg, and international partners, including the University College at London. So this lab runs 20 large-scale studies exploring impacts of arts engagement on mental health, social isolation, chronic disease, and other health outcomes. So this is a really large umbrella and a broad way of thinking about this. And I know that the University of Florida with Jill have been leading the field for some time now. So it's very exciting. Um, that is. So, Renee, you're somebody who also is a citizen, not just of the United States arena, but the whole world, because you travel extensively, you have so many contacts. Talk about some of the barriers or opportunities that you've seen in terms of considering the arts as an option for health and well-being, maybe in, a, in other parts of the world. Well, I, you know, certainly uh, I've had the chance to bring uh, presentations on, on music and, and the mind, which was one of our first convenings. That was the title of it. Uh, and I think you coined that title, actually, Francis. Uh, and then I had a, a webinar this last summer called Music and Mind Live. So I, I have a really strong sense of what the public cares about, what the public is interested in, certainly the music uh, concert attending public. Um, and that it, they are all in. They're fascinated. They want to know how this can be 
helpful to them. They want more information. It surprises me how how much is not known, what therapies are not understood, or 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 and the fact that people don't realize these these are available to them. So that's one of the barriers is really just messaging. Um, one of the other great things, though, that I found is um, certain arts organizations now, as a result, are pairing with community healthcare providers. And this is fostering collaboration across the boards. And for instance, uh, I witnessed at the LA Opera at a luncheon bringing all of their health partners together, sitting at a table, not knowing that Cal State at Northridge has a top drawer music therapy program. They have training, local rehabilitation. And so I watched these groups say, wait, do you mean we could have this in our hospital? We could have this where we're treating um, young people with mental health issues? I mean, this type of networking is possible with social prescribing, and it's very exciting to see what these options could be. Um, and I think, you know, the barriers really have to do with our over-reliance on drugs in a one-size-fits-all protocol and profits. And we're beginning to understand, certainly insofar as our government is funding health care, that um, the, the government, it's too expensive to pay for all of this, when especially these low-cost non-invasive treatments could really bring down health care costs over time. And social prescribing, of course, requires buy-in from physicians and healthcare organizations, governments, and communities. Um, and the opportunities are, besides you know, being cost-effective, there's rigorous qualitative research, which of course you're providing uh, and funding, community endpoint and, uh, input, and then this, this whole notion of integrative whole person health. So the UK and Massachusetts are both um, funding social prescription initiatives they have them in developed. So UK will have this fully prescribable by 2023. And I had just learned that Massachusetts is starting a similar program because their 40% of their budget is healthcare. So this could include uh, all kinds of group lessons, playlists, dance classes. I mean, what you can do with Parkinson's with dance, for instance, this bypassing of the part of the brain that causes us to shuffle and stop and stutter in Parkinson's is made fluid with music and rhythm uh, and movement. So these kinds of initiatives should be available to everyone. Um, and the shift towards preventative health care is a model for what we can really try and do in the US, don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, in fact, maybe this raises the question then about where do we draw the line in terms of what's under the umbrella of arts and health? Because uh, we're really talking about very broad aspects of human experience, uh, the appreciation of beauty, the whole field of aesthetics. Uh, as we try to focus in specifically on health interventions, and I've been talking about rigorous scientific strategies uh, to do those research studies, uh, how do we maintain, of course, this larger scale sense uh, of the joyfulness that can come to all of us in a less organized way <laughs> as a consequence of the arts and what they can do to enrich our lives? How, how, do, how do we deal with that part? No, it's true. It's true. I mean, we, we, we can address some of this broadly, of course. This is what the Neuro Arts Blueprint is trying to do. Um, but, you know, arts and science have value beyond the health benefits. And science is so much more. I think of science as entirely creative because you're asking what, how, why. You're asking larger questions of human existence, which is something that's, that artists have always done. Yes. Um, and so far as we're the muses for human experience, whether past, present, or future, uh, science is really kind of in that creative space. Uh, and there's a reason why people like Einstein, they, they were violinists. I have found that this amateur musicians have belonged very much to the scientific community all along, and certainly to medicine, don't you think? Well, you are one, you're an excellent musician. And it's not hard to find people to join my rock and roll band because the scientists are all like, yeah, yeah, call on me, please. I'm ready. I'll sing. I'll play an instrument. I'll do something. I love this stuff. Yeah, the overlap is really, really impressive. Arts and, 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 uh, and science tend to go together. And maybe and we should realize that we're also we're we we have to establish a rigor of uh, and technical foundation to what we do that right. you know requires that 10,000 hours of practice and and there's no question that it that we can't skip over that part so we have that in common as well 
That's a really good point. There's a lot of joy and there's a lot of discipline. And for the scientist, those moments of discovery are, are interrupted by long periods of hard work and oftentimes frustration and failure. I suspect you would say the same is true for somebody oh whose life is oh all about my. making music. <laughs> I, I sang fabulously in the practice room and in the dressing room for years before I could do it on stage. And well into my career, actually, I just thought, darn, that was so great in the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of it takes mastery uh, besides the curiosity. You can have an idea and, and an innovative idea, but then it takes years to establish the proof of it. Mm -hmm. So it's a prime. I think arts and music um, are, a, not, are a good vehicle for this wider implementation of integrative medicine. I um, totally agree with that. And that's why the NIH is really thrilled to be part of this. Uh, we do have a whole national center for complementary and integrative health. And this is a wonderful fit in that effort where we are trying to get away from the tendency to call everybody by their diagnosis and instead recognize we are complicated individuals that need a holistic approach. And if you're really serious about that, then you want to bring every possible capability of healing uh, to the table. And the arts and music are certainly a powerful one. And I'm really glad we're able to do more in that space than we ever have before. Yes, thank you so much, Francis. And I also think that um, this is a democratic way of looking at uh, medicine and science because we have the potential for reaching a lot more people uh, through this kind of artistic lens. It's not something that makes people feel comfortable. Telehealth can reach more people and this works very well and it pairs so well with other uh, interventions. So thank you so much. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. But before we go, Francis and I did not think this session would be complete without a musical collaboration, which we enjoyed taping together a few weeks ago. So I take my inspiration from Francis, who manages always to keep on the sunny side of life. So the song was popularized by the Carter family in the 20s. So another inspiration from Francis, because your father and your childhood really had you steeped in the great folk tradition of the U.S. Oh, yes, indeed. I learned this song when I was probably five or six years old and still enjoy well, hearing it or singing it every chance I get. Yeah, and it was it was also it was composed in 1899. So I can I feel safe that I can call that classical. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> There's a dark and a troubled side of life There's a bright and a sunny side too Though we meet with the darkness and strife The sunny side we also may view Keep on the sunny side, always on the sunny side Keep on the sunny side of life it will help us every day, it will brighten all the way, if we'll keep on the sunny side of life. The storm in its fury broke today, dashing hopes that we've cherished so dear. Clouds and storm will in time pass away, the sun again will shine bright and clear. Keep on the sunny side, always on the sunny side. Keep on the sunny side of life. It will help us every day, it will brighten all the way. It will keep on the sunny side of life. Let us greet with the song of hope each day. Though the moments be cloudy or fair, let us trust in your Savior always, who keepeth everyone in his care. Keep on the sunny side, always on the sunny side. Keep on the sunny side of life. It will help us every day. It will brighten all the way. It will keep on the sunny side of life.
Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Thanks, everybody. In our next conversation, PBS NewsHour's Amna Navaz talks with Lori Zeffrin, Vice President at the Commonwealth Fund, about systemic racism in healthcare. Hi, everybody. I'm Amna Navaz from the PBS NewsHour, and I am honored and excited to be here today to have this really important conversation with Dr. Lori Zeffrin. This idea, this topic, I think a lot of people find it hard to kind of define for themselves what it means, what structural racism means. And we talk about it across a number of institutions, but specific to healthcare. When you think about structural racism in healthcare, what do you think about? What does it look like? How does it show up? You know, it, it shows up in, in many ways. Uh, I mean, I, I like to break it down in two ways. One, you know, let's talk about the social factors that impact health, and then let's talk about how people experience health and health care within the healthcare system. And so, you know, we all know that social factors have an outsized impact on health. Um, and we know that, you know, where people live and work and play and the effects of that. And so in terms of, you know, where people live, Black and Hispanic people t live in communities where they're exposed to higher pollution, um, have access to less adequate nutrition and housing and, um, and toxic environments that can cause like higher rates of asthma and cancer. And um, we see this manifesting um, today as we think about, you know, the impacts as we think about the COVID-19 crisis. Um, there's also the stress of being in over-policed environments or living in communities with disproportionate amount of police surveillance. There's even new research coming out just showing the impact of, on, of health outcomes on that. Um, there's, you know, access to high paying jobs that provide paid leave or provide enough, um, enough uh, wealth, uh, wealth building opportunities. Um, and also the ability to access healthcare, that coverage piece, right? If you don't have a, a high paying job that provides health insurance, that also creates inequities as well. And then, you know, as we think about care within the four walls of the healthcare system, you know, we'd like to think that, you know, our healthcare systems are, are immune to, to racism, but we also, we have to understand that, you know, the people within the health system and the healthcare system is part of our broader American society. Um, and so we have to see how, how people are treated when they get care, right? And when we think of our healthcare system, you know, which is steeped in our society, you know, there are biases, you know, for example, thoughts that black women can tolerate more pain, data showing different quality of treatment being offered to, to, to black people, um, studies detailing bias and discrimination. And so, and how does this manifest when we think about maternal mortality rates? I think that's the tip of the iceberg, really, of, of a sign of a healthcare system that's failing people most vulnerable to these inequities. Well, let's be specific about this, because I'm not sure most people know about these maternal mortality rates, and it's something we should note. The Biden administration uh, just recently highlighted, right, they called together a summit, said this is an absolute crisis in America, it needs to be addressed. The fact that it's getting presidential and White House level attention should tell people just how bad it is. People have babies all over the world, but here in America, the disparities are clear. Tell us a little bit more about how you've seen that structural racism show up when it comes to maternal mortality rates. Absolutely. Well, you know, just as, as you've highlighted, when we look at maternal mortality rates in this country um, and we compare ourselves to other developed nations, um, we have the highest maternal mortality rates and, and, and they're not going down. You know, first, let's take the disparities. If you think of why this is happening, um, there's so many reasons. Um, but, you know, you know, here are the top four, for example, you know, black women don't get the care they need before, uh, during, and after pregnancy, right? Um, whether it's a disproportionate number of, of black people being uninsured or um, not having access to that care is, is, is really critical. Um, societal racism is, is literally killing black women. Um, racism is baked into you know, our American life and our communities and hospitals are no exception. And so you know, our society has produced inequalities that leave um, black mothers more vulnerable um, to poor health um, and poor health outcomes, um, having less access to primary health care, to healthy foods, reliable transportation, 
um, and safe neighborhoods and, and good schools and decent jobs. Um, you know, there's another fact, like if you're a black woman in America, regardless of your education, you are two or three times more likely to die during childbirth than, than a white woman. And so, you know, so when, when black women seek care, for example, they're often not taken seriously, regardless of how educated they are. I mean, we've all heard the stories of Serena Williams and the, there are countless others. And so education is not a protector, you know, and, you know, when you talk to black moms, you know, you know, there's data showing that black, black moms don't get the same respect and attention when they show up at hospitals or prenatal visits are often rushed or doctors and nurses don't listen to them. So there's research that reflects these really disturbing patterns. And so as we think of this implicit and explicit bias in our healthcare system, it's really costing, um, it's costing the health and, and lives of, of women of color. And, um, and I mentioned the fourth thing is, you know, when we think about just the impact of racism and discrimination, um, that's very stressful. Um, and that stress can manifest in also um, an impact on people's health, right? You know, people refer to it as the weathering phenomena, phenomenon, which is, you know, the thought of like these, you know, these indignities of day to day racism, um, you know, or sort of bolstering oneself against racism can literally age black women prematurely and, and chip away at their health. I've also heard it referred to as toxic stress, right? A number of studies and long-term kind of looks at this showing exactly how detrimental it can be specific to black women in America. These stories you're sharing, we all know the experiences uh, that women of color in particular have in our healthcare system, that leads to mistrust in that system in the first place, right? And when you look at the numbers of who's allowed to even kind of exist in those highest ranks to make it to be a doctor in this system, women of color are sorely underrepresented. Talk to me a little bit about trust, about um, how to build that when people who are seeking care there and don't receive adequate care there aren't seeing themselves represented in those ranks. Right, so building trust is, is I think central. Um, and, you know, as a physician, you know, in, in my interaction with, with patients and people, I, I really believe it's my responsibility to, to build that trust. And I think that responsibility extends to health systems and government and, and leaders because we, we see the many ways that, that um, mistrust um, can, you know, manifest, you know, from unequal treatment outcomes um, and experiences that I've mentioned before. So. Yes, I believe there is a way um, to build a health system that everyone can trust. And I think first we, you know, we must fundamentally value people um, and individuals. Um, we need to be able to build compassion and empathy uh, to engender that trust. You know, when I walk into a healthcare system, you know, there's already a power dynamic. This isn't sort of Lori doctor, it's just sort of Lori. There's already this, this power dynamic and this sort of stress because you're not going to the hospital for fun. You know, you're, you're going because you, you know, you're, you're seeking answer to questions, you're concerned about the health of yourself or your family member. So that in itself is, is a scary experience. And so when I'm walking in, you know, someone that's at the door that says, how are you today? How can I help you? Right? I mean, that makes a big difference in building trust. And so that's what I mean when I say it's the responsibility of the entire healthcare system to build that trust. What kind of changes could leaders out there be putting in place today that would help to lead to better health care outcomes tomorrow? You know, I, I, I approach it as thinking, you know, top down and also bottom up, you know, top down in terms of what are the big P policies that need to be in place and then bottom up, what are things that can happen at the community level, at, 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 at the ground level that can be supported? You know, from the top down, you know, in terms of, um, big P policy, you know, we know that policies um, have deeply entrenched systemic racism, right? From policies affecting housing to access to jobs, to access to education. You know, there's, there's a lot of information ab about that. Or if you think about policies like civil rights legislation, which helped essentially desegregate hospitals overnight because states could not get funding um, if, if they had segregated hospitals. And that immediately helped sort of create a significant decrease in black infant mortality rates and maternal mortality rates. And so policies are powerful 
And so how can, as we think about policies, and I think we're at an opportune policy moment, as we think about policies, just as we think of budget impact of policies, how can we think of equity impact of policies, right? Intentional um, intentional equity impact of policies or, or unintentional um, inequities that may result from policies. And so that's something that I'm thinking deeply about. And, and I think it's going to be really important to, to build that into our policy making process. Um, and I think the bottom up piece, because policies take a long time to trickle down, um, you know, how can we support people now through community-based interventions, supporting community organizations, um, diversifying the workforce? I think those are, those are bottom-up approaches that we can start doing now to also address the inequities that we're seeing. We I mean, know all that change is going to take strong leadership from folks like you. So Dr. Lori Zephyrin, thank you so much. Good to talk to you too. Thank you so much. Up next, we'll hear from Dr. Tom Frieden, former CDC director and now president and CEO at Resolve to Save Lives, about the need for pandemic preparedness and the difference it can make as illustrated through his organization's new report. In a first of its kind report, Resolve to Save Lives spotlights the stories of epidemics that didn't happen, highlighting outbreaks that were stopped in their tracks by strong public health systems, excellent communications, and political support. The past 20 years have been burdened by a series of international health emergencies, resulting in lives lost and disrupted economies. Never has this been more apparent than during the COVID-19 pandemic, which soberly demonstrated that our health and livelihood is dependent on others anywhere in the world. What news outlets don't capture are the thousands of epidemics that didn't happen. Our report, Epidemics That Didn't Happen, shows that epidemics don't have to happen. That if we work together, if we commit to finding, stopping, and preventing health threats, we can make the world a much safer and much healthier place. COVID provides us with the most teachable moment of our lifetimes. If we don't fix it now, we're not going to fix it. It's that constant everyday work that really makes the difference. Finding those initial cases and being able to respond to one or two cases stops them from becoming hundreds of cases and then thousands of cases. In Kenya, the risk of an anthrax outbreak was controlled in just over a month because of quick action and trust from members of the community. Community-based surveillance is where we survey our village to raise the community, uh, the voice of our community members, in that they'll be giving us information in case of emergence of any, any sign of a disease or in case of any appearance of any disease. The Kenya action was really successful because it used networks of community volunteers like the Red Cross to engage in things that are important to communities where they are. So. The, the thing that it really highlights is that uh, pandemic prevention, epidemic preparedness starts all the way at the individual level in the community and needs to go all the way up into the highest levels of the government. And we need to start working more effectively to address preparedness right from the community level. And so the interventions we, de we develop and design should strengthen you know, um, health systems as a whole. In Brazil, a massive yellow fever outbreak was prevented by an ambitious vaccination plan and advance action. In December 2016, it became clear to the epidemiologists monitoring the yellow fever episodics in a specific area of Brazil, in southeast Brazil, that an epidemic was imminent. There were three major aspects of the success of the yellow fever response in Brazil. First, the capacity of the country to increased dramatically its vaccine production and to deploy the vaccines to the population and municipalities at risk. Second, to expand in a couple of months the laboratory network countrywide, all states able to do PCR, and to use the surveillance of episodics and the modeling and the geographic information system to anticipate cases in humans approximately one month in advance. It means vaccinating in advance the population at risk. We need to ensure that systems are in place in countries um, to better prevent, to better detect and better respond to outbreaks. That includes ensuring that the funding is placed, the human beings are in place and trained, and that the materials required 
you know, to respond to these outbreaks are available. We need to act and we need to act collectively. These epidemics that didn't happen show us how the trajectory of an epidemic can be fundamentally altered when a country invests in and prioritizes preparedness for infectious disease outbreaks and readiness to act when it strikes. With this pandemic, we have a unique opportunity to invest in public health, to prevent the next pandemic, and to ensure that as a world, we are never, ever again caught so underprepared. Aspen Ideas Health is generously supported by Abbott, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, the CDC Foundation, Cedar sinai the Commonwealth Fund, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Mount Sinai Health System, and Pfizer. We now turn to a conversation about combating a different but ongoing and growing epidemic, obesity. Dr. Morris Birnbaum, Pfizer's Chief Scientific Officer for Internal Medicine, is in conversation with foreign policy columnist Elise Lovett. Hello, I'm Elise Lovett of Foreign Policy Magazine and glad to be with you at Aspen Ideas Health. Today we're talking about obesity and the epidemic of cardiometabolic disease, which is the leading cause of death among human beings. And the numbers are staggering and they're growing. And beyond the biological effects, there are a number of societal factors that make treating these diseases even more challenging. Joining me to talk about this is Dr. Morris Birnbaum, Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer at Pfizer's Internal Medicine Research Unit. Maury, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Elise. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah. Well, look, everyone is so focused on the COVID-19 pandemic over the last year or so. And I think there's this tendency, isn't there, to focus less on other health concerns, especially cardiovascular disease, which, as we know, is one of the, the number one cause of death. So why should we be so concerned about what you call these cardiometabolic diseases? Uh Right now, well, I mean, first of all, it's you know, it's it's totally understandable and justifiable to be concerned with COVID for the last year. Um, but COVID actually turns out to be a reminder of why it is so important to think about metabolic disease and obesity. One of the most significant risks for serious disease in COVID is, in fact, obesity, mm -hmm. and that is very typical of this abnormal metabolic state. Uh, it, Obesity, when it leads to insulin resistance and abnormal metabolism, increases your risk, not only for COVID, serious COVID, but for heart disease, uh, cancer, diabetes, you know, and many other chronic systemic diseases, which really have a profound negative effect on people's lives. And, and it's, it's like this problem is largely unaddressed and, and few medications to help the problem. And it's, and it's global, really, in scope. Well, it's exactly, and it really reflects the change in our environment over the last 50 to 100 years. You know, we, we, we didn't evolve to deal with all of the food around us, and we also didn't evolve to have other means of transportation other than walking. So we're leading a very, very different life than we were meant to in some senses. And, and that's frankly what's created it. So it's easy to say, and many people suggest, well, then why don't we just eat less and exercise more? And um, you know, that, that is a uh, prescription that, that works on paper um, or ideally, but in reality, because of physiological changes that accompany obesity, that in reality is extremely difficult to carry out. Now you view these diseases as a single epidemic as opposed to individual problems because they're, they're all interrelated. Now talk to us about that. And how does, for instance, unintentional weight loss fit in it seems like the opposite of obesity, but it's also very dangerous. Right, um, I, I, I guess the, the best way to describe our view of these metabolic diseases is a cluster of related diseases, which probably have a common origin. Uh, it, is, it, you know, the, it is interesting that these diseases all seem to be promoted by an abnormal metabolic state. And yes, kidney disease, heart disease, blindness, you know, they all come out, they're all different expressions of the metabolic state. But, but we believe that by understanding how the metabolic state, this abnormal metabolic state, promotes the diseases and interrupting that connection, 
we could actually develop one therapy or a set of therapies that actually going to impact a lot of different diseases. So it, it really is this common basis of these seemingly disparate diseases that has led us to a science-based strategy to try to treat them all. Um, now, that is not to say that we and other, uh, other folks are not trying to treat them in the traditional way of developing directed heart drugs. We do that also. But what's a little bit more unusual about our approach now is we really think about these diseases more in the context of the abnormal metabolism that promotes it. Now, it's interesting you mentioned cachexia. Cachexia is unintended weight loss, which is also associated with an abnormal meta metabolic state. You know, in obesity, the problem is we store too many nutrients and can't control that. In cachexia, the problem is we burn those nutrients and we can't stop that loss of muscle mass and we lose our appetite. So it's, it's you know, in, in many ways, it is the opposite of obesity. And the reason we work on it is, is twofold. First, it's an extremely common disease, which is incredibly disruptive for patients and their families. And second of all, the expertise we have in, in, in developing drugs to, to, to modify people's metabolism and modify their appetite, that expertise can really be used to address problems in cachexia. Now you mentioned the stigma around obesity. I'm glad you did because I, I feel like a lot of people, you know, don't even seek treatment for obesity because of the attitudes surrounding this, that it's self-inflicted, as you say, or a lifestyle choice. And then, as you mentioned, that leads to depression and, and so much more than a, you know, kind of typical biological condition. Well, I, you know, yes, there, I mean, there is a pervasive um, stigma about obesity. There's a bias against uh, obese people generally, and it's, it's irrational. And it's just really, it comes down to another form of uh, prejudice that is ba not based on any fact at all. Now, the community has been trying to emphasize, the scientific community has been trying to emphasize that it isn't a, a, a choice. It's not a behavioral choice. It's a disease. The, the issue becomes many people who are obese, when they hear they have a disease, except that as a negative, a judgment on, on, on them. Uh, and, and that's really not what we mean when we say um, uh, diabetes, uh, diabetes and obesity, and particularly obesity or diseases. So, you know, th there's a real gap here in knowledge and a real gap here in, um, in language that we can use at, where the, that language is not associated with implications that we really don't mean. Yeah, I mean, we've heard so much in the last year about the importance of science. Connect the dots for me between all of the knowledge Pfizer is accumulating over the years about how these diseases arise in and affect the body with this kind of recentering on research and development as a means to develop potential treatments. Right, I mean, de developing an effective safe drug is an enormously complicated process which involves a lot of people but it is always based on a scientific understanding. The drug will not work if, we, if our understanding of the biology and our strategy to change the biology or to fix the biology, if that isn't sound, no matter how well we do all of the other things um, necessary to develop a drug, it's not gonna work. It has to be more than just a Band-Aid. It has to be more than just a Band-Aid. And, um, and, and it's, it's, it's very challenging, it's, it, to be honest, it's too much for the pharmaceutical industry to do alone. We, we do this in collaboration with our academic colleagues. We do often do it in collaboration with other pharmaceutical companies, but underneath all of that, we at Pfizer have to understand the basic biology of the disease. And that results from being aware of the academic community as well as many, many years at Pfizer making drugs like, for example, blood pressure drugs, lipid drugs, which we've been incredibly successful about. It's helped a lot of people, but it's also given us a lot of experience and um, th that's gonna benefit people who have other diseases when we, can, when we develop drugs for that. Well, clearly as we continue to learn about and combat all the health issues related to the coronavirus, it's important that we keep on top of these other diseases that are equally deadly and, and can really affect our quality of life if not treated. And we know that Pfizer is, is working on treatments to address them. Dr. Morris Birnbaum, Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer at Pfizer's Internal Medicine Research Unit. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Elise. It's been a pleasure. And now let's take a mindful moment.
guys, do me a favor, grab a piece of paper and a pen. I'm totally serious. It can be the back of an envelope, whatever you got, nothing fancy, but I am serious. You got it? Okay. Hi, my name is Wendy McNaughton. I am an illustrator and a graphic journalist. That means that I tell stories and connect people through drawing. And I am so happy to be here with you today at Aspen Ideas Health. You might know my work from the New York Times. I had a drawn column in there, a bunch of other places. Um, but since the pandemic, I have turned my attention to something far, far more serious. Drawing tugboats with six-year-olds. Yes, it is more serious and I believe incredibly urgent, especially now, and here's why. Drawing, given the right conditions, boosts kids' resilience. It reduces their perfectionism, we could all probably use that, and it cultivates their self-worth. Drawing is one of the, if not the best ways for kids to process their emotions. And that includes trauma, maybe like a pandemic. Can you imagine how the world would be different if all kids had access to an environment like that? We're creating it right now on Draw Together, uh, interactive drawing show for kids ages four to nine, hence the giant pencil behind me. But today I am going to draw together with you, my friend. Yes, uh, we're going to do one of the most impactful exercises that we do in Draw Together. It's very short, don't worry. It is inspired by the wonderful cartoonist, Linda Berry, and it is called The Heart Spiral. So before we begin, let's just do a quick check-in. Check in with your body. How are you feeling? Okay, remember that. Come on over here. Grab your pen. Doesn't matter, you do not have to, you know, be an artist. This is something for everybody, okay? Everybody's an artist, by the way. But we can talk about that later. All right, draw a heart right in the middle of the page. You got it, good job, look at you. All right, now do this with me. It's called Draw Together for a Reason. Put your pen right there in the middle, and now let's draw another heart around the outside right close to that line inside, but when we get up to the top, don't stop moving, don't close it off. Keep your line going around the outside and you're making an ever-growing spiral heart. Keep your pen moving, slowly well, at your own pace, but steadily, and get us to that line as close as you can without touching. If you do, no big deal. Nothing's gonna happen. There's no wrong way to draw a heart spiral. Try and get it close to that line inside. Just keep moving slow and steady. Now when we get to the bottom, let's do this together. Let's take a deep breath in. Good job. And as we go down, a breath out. And a breath in, one more. And as we go down, a breath out. Let's make one more big one around the outside. It gets a little wonky, who cares? That's fine, there is no wrong way to draw. And we get down to the bottom and bring the line out to the side and stop. What does that look like to you? I think it looks like a snail. Whatever, you're, whatever you see, turn it into something. Maybe it's a flower, maybe it's a person with an arm out, whatever you got, there you go, whatever you see. Hello. All right, look up. Good job, look at you draw a heart spiral thing. Good job. Now let's check in again. Do a scan, how do you feel? Interesting. Turns out in just a minute, we can radically shift our insides with a drawing. Drawing and doodling like this reduces stress and anxiety. It helps us focus and it increases our memory retention. So it turns out Drawing is not just for artists, it's for all of us. It helps keep our brain sharp and keeps our hearts open and growing. So, enjoy the rest of the conference and keep drawing. All you need is a pen and a piece of paper. In this next conversation, my colleague Tom Costello of NBC News sits down with NASA astronaut Dr. Serena Anand-Chancellor and Haley Arsenault, Inspiration4 mission participant, 
to talk about space and health and how what we learn while exploring the heavens can help improve health back here on Earth. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Costello with NBC News, and we have an exciting and really, I think, a riveting conversation for you today. This is part of NBC News Universal's news group partnership with Aspen Ideas Health, and the topic today is medical research in space. And we've got some fascinating uh, women to talk to about this. To begin with, Dr. Serena Anyon-Chancellor. She is a NASA astronaut and a physician who logged 197 days in space in 2018 on the International Space Station. And then we've got Haley Arsenault, and she is set to become the youngest American ever to go into space on the first all-civilian voyage set to depart later this year. Now, this is the cover of St. Jude magazine, and that's Haley on the cover. Just got this magazine in the mail. Uh, And Haley is a physician assistant at St. Jude. Now, this is part of an all-civilian mission, and no veteran astronauts on board at all. They are going up on a multi-day mission, a trip around the Earth on a SpaceX rocket, probably towards the end of September or so. On the Today Show recently, we profiled Haley and the group that's going up on this all-civilian mission, and here's a clip from that. The inspiration for crew now complete. 38-year-old Commander Jared Isaacman, the billionaire with the dream, fly to space on a SpaceX rocket and raise a staggering $200 million for St. Jude Children's Hospital. 29-year-old Haley Arsenault, representing Hope, a childhood cancer survivor and now a physician's assistant at St. Jude. And this morning, two new crew members revealed. 41-year-old Chris Sombrowski, representing generosity, chosen from among those who've donated to St. Jude. An Air Force veteran now working in the aerospace industry, a friend was actually selected, but he can't go. And 51-year-old Dr. Siam Proctor, representing prosperity, a pilot and community college science professor, once a NASA astronaut candidate, now a passionate space advocate. Haley, uh, let's start with you because we just come out of this clip. This is an exciting all-civilian mission, but you have this unusual connection to medicine and to St. Jude, and now to this mission in that you, at at the age of 10, uh, were struggling with bone cancer, and you survived, and then you decided to stick out a career, to stake out and stick out a career at St. Jude as a physician assistant. Why do you want to go into space now? Well, St. Jude called me at the beginning of January and told me about this mission, this first all-civilian mission to space, and how it was being used for good and to benefit St. Jude. And we're hoping through this mission to raise $200 million for the hospital that will fund research and fund cures. But on top of that, I realized that this mission was going to give these kids going through cancer and other survivors hope and show them that they don't need to limit themselves because they can do so much. And so I immediately said yes and was so honored to be invited and part of this mission. In fact, you're going to be the first person ever in space who wears a prosthesis, right? I have an internal prosthesis. I had bone cancer, and uh, in order to sing, to save my leg, St. Jude had to remove part of my bone that was affected by the tumor, and they replaced it with this internal prosthesis that could be expanded without surgery, and it saved me several surgeries over the years, and, uh, and it gave me so much more quality of life, but I will be the first person in space with an internal prosthesis. Okay, we're going to get back to more on that in a minute, but let's go to Serena. Serena, you were in her place just a few years ago. And you had a deep medical bench, a background before you went on that mission. So uh, how did your medical training prepare prepare you for that mission? You know, Tom, the interesting thing is, first of all, Haley, I'm so excited for you. I cannot wait to see how this mission goes and all that you'll get to experience. Because I was stunned when I got up there on the space station in 2018 at how much of the life science research we do on board ISS is to benefit human health on Earth, and that includes cancer research. So as a physician, and I'm a physician today here at LSU, um, I, I love to work on things that matter to my patients, that my patients can you know, react to and respond to. And so when I got up there and said, wow, I'm working on projects looking at cancer research, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, these are all things that affect people and people that I care about and, and certainly patients that I treat. And so that was probably the biggest boon for me was to realize how much benefit 
I was going to get even during that short time period performing this research. Uh, Serena, a little bit more on that. I've wondered this question for years, covering NASA for the better part of 17 years now. Do we have good, tangible, scientific discoveries that we can point to that we've made in space uh, on any number of topics as it relates to medicine? Do we have good medical breakthroughs or cancer research that really has, has paved new ground? Yeah, Tom, absolutely. One of the experiments I worked on was one called Angiex, where we were looking at the cells that actually line your blood vessels. Those are called endothelial cells, but that's what tumors use to build a blood supply. And what the scientists proposed with that was that those cells would grow different, would grow better in the microgravity environment. They're a little harder to grow on Earth, so you can test different chemotherapy against them. But up on orbit, they like to grow, and it's easier for us to test those chemotherapeutic agents. I hadn't really thought about that until I got up there, and I got to talk with the scientists every day and look at these cells under a microscope, and immediately I could see the impact that this would have on cancer treatment. And, and has that already translated into thera therapies or therapeutic breakthroughs on any level on, on, in any kind of a disease already? I think we're certainly very close. The, the other interesting thing that we've looked at with cancer chemotherapy is, is certain companies have, has, have sent up their chemotherapeutic agent that's already in use for cancer treatment across the globe to see if they can refine it, make it better, track and how those liquids and everything and, and even like nanoparticle transport, how that works in microgravity. So there's so many examples I could give that are already in practice and things that are just about to burst over the edge. Okay, so back now to Haley. And Haley, you guys are going to be doing some research or at least experiments up on your mission. It's only a few day mission, we believe. Uh, but can you give us a sense of what you'll be doing up there? So we're still working on the details of the research projects that we're going to work on, but we are going to be deeper into space than, than people have gone in about 15 years. And that comes with a different radiation profile. And so we would like to measure that and, um, and the effects after that, um, which of course, coming from my background with oncology, I'm very interested in that. Yeah, that's an important point because you do have, you know, you've got a very personal connection because not only did you have a personal experience with bone cancer, you're in the oncology ward at St. Jude right now. I work inpatient with leukemia and lymphoma patients as a PA. I have the best job ever. And how does that, how does your experience having been a child cancer survivor, how does that help you in your job every day? So I like to, you know, basically show these kids every day that they can grow up and they can achieve their dreams. And, you know, it's not the first thing I talk to them about, you know, it's, it's always about the patient at the, um, but then I, I like to share with them that I also was in their shoes, especially with the, the newly diagnosed patients. Um, because I remember when I was going through treatment and I would meet a survivor and, you know, their hair had come back and they had grown up. And I just remember feeling hope when I met them. And so I try to share that with them. You know, a few years ago, um, Serena, a few years ago, Scott Kelly spent a year in space and he has a twin, Mark Kelly, who's also an astronaut. And so they, they use that opportunity to compare how Scott's body changed over that course of the year versus how his brother, being the control sample on Earth, uh, whether there were things that changed. And one thing that they noticed was that uh, they had a, a very slight difference in, in a piece of chromosome, and I'll let you discuss it because I'm going to get into college biology and I have no business being there. But the bottom line is they, 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 they did discover that he had uh, some shortening and then lengthening of his telomeres, which are at the end of chromosomes, right? That's correct. So what they did find towards the end of Scott's flight was that there was an actual lengthening, first a shortening, then a lengthening of the telomeres. Once Scott landed back on Earth, those kind of quickly resolved back to where he probably would have been had he remained on Earth. But it was curious because a lot of people see extended periods of time and space and they equivalent that to aging. And, you know, for example, we lose a lot of bone in space. We have loss of muscle mass, there's muscle atrophy. Um, and so those are things that we track, certainly when you're up there for six months and 12 months at a time. And could that lead to new discoveries in the treatment of osteoporosis? Absolutely. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that even on the, the time that Haley's up in orbit, that those short three or four days, 
if you were to take a look at her urine, the first 12 hours that she's up there, you would see those microscopic changes in her urine, indicating that there's bone loss. It happens that quickly. You know, when Scott came back to Earth, um, I talked to him multiple times, and he conceded he felt awful. Um, and it wasn't just a one-off that lasted 12 hours. He felt awful for a, a good period of time before his body recovered because he had been in space in orbit for a year and didn't have that constant gravitational pull. Um, that's going to be a challenge if we ever send people on a, an 18-month, maybe three-year mission to Mars and back, right? Yeah, Tom, you read my mind. So even when I came back after about, you know, six to seven months, boy, you don't feel great this first 24 hours. There's a lot of things your body is suddenly readapting to, your brain, your muscles, everything to this gravity stimulus that has been absent for so long. Um, and now you picture, you know, heading out towards Mars, maybe a short surface, say, and then coming all the way back and now being reintroduced to Earth's gravity once again. What is that going to feel like? What countermeasures can we put on that vehicle to help prevent some of those changes on the way out and on the way back? It's a totally new domain. It's a different world. Exploration class missions are, are what we need to do, and we need to prepare to head towards Mars. But that's the same concerns that we have, Tom. Yeah, I, I interviewed the head of NASA a number of years ago, and we talked about the potential for going to Mars someday. Uh, and he said, listen, we got two big problems. Number one, we got to make sure that, uh, that the crew doesn't kill each other because that's a long time to be sitting on top of each other in something that's about the size of a school bus if you're lucky. So that's number one. Number two, we've got to figure out how not to get killed by the radiation exposure uh, with that kind of a long duration mission. I mean, that still is a problem that uh, they don't really have cracked yet, right? That's correct. Space radiation is one of our biggest challenges, uh, both towards human health and in the research domain, because it's so difficult to perform here on the planetary surface. Um, you know, it, on the space station in low Earth orbit, you're pretty well protected by the atmosphere, the magnetic fields, and by the vehicle itself. And the moment we set out, just like Haley mentioned, she's going to be in a different orbital profile where her radiation field is going to be different than what we even experience on ISS. And so as many measurements as we can get to characterize that field and then predict what the health effects may be will help. But Tom, that is one of space radiation is one of our biggest challenges. Okay. So Haley, back to you now, and you're on this mission that's taking off within the next six months or so, and you are a, a cancer survivor. I'm guessing you've had to have conversations uh, with medical personnel at SpaceX about your own personal history with cancer and whether there should be any concern about radiation exposure, even if it is for just a few days. I've talked to my St. Jude doctors, my orthopedic surgeon, and then the SpaceX physicians as well. And we feel confident that with our short duration mission that the radiation exposure won't be significant. Um, but that is something that we've talked about. So you are the chief medical officer on board this flight. Uh, that's a big promotion for a PA. Congratulations. Thank you. But let me ask you, what will you be watching as it relates to the health of your crew? Any concerns that they have, I will be there for them. And, you know, I think as part of the research, they said I'll be drawing some blood and, um, and you know, I'll, I'll have some um, activities like that on board. But then I'll also prepare for any type of emergency that could arise. You know, do you, I guess any kind of an emergency would mean it could be literally just a cut or something like that, right? You hope it's nothing more serious than that. Hopefully nobody has a cardiac event. Absolutely. And we're going to be prepared. And, um, and I've already started those conversations with the SpaceX physicians. And, um, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that our crew stays safe. So to that end, uh, will they be giving you any extra training, for example, in God forbid there is that kind of an emergency? Will you have... Uh, necessary drugs on board? Will you have a defibrillator, anything of that nature? I'm, I'm not exactly sure what payload we're going to bring up, but I will be getting some extra training for any possible in-flight situation. Let's underscore that there is this kind of a, an unusual symbiotic relationship between SpaceX, uh, the billionaire Jared Isaacman, who is footing the bill for this, and this massive fundraising effort to raise $200 million for St. Jude, which is the biggest fundraising effort uh, ever in St. Jude's history, which is why you're on the cover of the magazine. <laughs> um, Serena, can we come back to you? You know, we have been flying people in space now for about 60 years or so, almost, right? And I'm wondering, what are the biggest, what are the biggest medical 
Uh, what's the what's the biggest piece of medical knowledge that you would say we've gained over that period of time? I, I was reading recently that when we first sent people into Earth, we didn't know if their if their eyeballs would float out of their eye sockets. We had such a limited idea of what the exposure would do to us. Yeah, I think when we first sent people, we didn't know if they'd be able to swallow and digest food normally. And it turns out you know, your body works really well in the space environment, but things do change. And what I would tell you, Tom, is that we haven't finished discovering what happens, what different changes occur in the human body. We do have changes in the eyes. We see maybe some swelling around the optic discs. We, you know, of course, see the bone loss, the muscle mass atrophy. You know, there, there have been recent reports about even clotting and clotting events that we've seen in space. And we seem to be surprised. And it's, it's only because we have a limited number of people that have flown in space for a limited amount of time. So I'd say we're not done discovering yet. Yeah, Scott Kelly and Mark Kelly are about my size. We're not giants. We're all about 5'7", five, 5'8", five, or so. Uh, Scott said, you know, the greatest thing happened when I was up there. My, my spinal cord expanded a bit, so he gained an inch or so. And then when he came back to Earth, he lost the inch. And he said, ah, I was so close to gaining an inch or two. But I've talked to astronauts who've said, especially tall astronauts, who've said that when they are on station their spine really hurts because of the expansion in their spinal cord because there's not the gravity uh, that's kind of keeping the vertebrae uh, all together. Yeah, I'd say the first few days, I definitely had a little bit of pain kind of in the mid portion of my back. A lot of astronauts have that in the mid to low portion. It's so much in that the first few nights, it would kind of wake me up from sleep and I had to crunch my legs into a little bit of a fetal position to relieve that strain. That is very common. It went away after about three days in flight. Some people don't have it at all, but yeah, we do see that commonly. These are some of the things I hope to get to talk with Haley about before she gets to fly. So can we ask you how difficult, you're the only one here who's been in space, how difficult is it to sleep in space? So I, Tom, I'm gonna be honest. I think I was on one end of the spectrum. I loved sleeping in space and I slept very well. I think there's a gamut, there's a bell-shaped curve. But I will say that at least on station, we had very quiet, dark crew quarters. So it was a little easier for me to sleep. Gonna be a little different for, for Haley. She's obviously gonna be a little closer to her crewmates, but you know, with the right earplugs and eye protection and everything, I slept really well. Okay, now I've got to ask you the, the, uh, the delicate question, and that is, a, a lot of people have wondered, how do you deal with GI issues, to put it in a, uh, a very uh, G-rated uh, conversation form here? Uh, does, sure. Do things process normally when you're on station, especially if you're up there for as long as you were? Yeah, you know, surprisingly they do. Um, again, early days people thought, would food move through your intestinal tract the same? And it does, something called peristalsis, which forces that food along the food pipe and through the intestines works beautifully. Um, so I'd say the challenging part is not getting that food to move through the system. We try and stay really well hydrated. It's making sure that when you have to use the space toilet, you do so very carefully with all protections in place to make sure there's nothing escaping. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I think <laughs> every we all get the picture. What are you most looking forward to learning about, Haley, on your first trip into space? What what big unanswered question do you have? What do you want to experience? What are you, what are you thinking about this? I have so many personal questions, um, such as, you know, that overview effect. When somebody sees Earth from space for the first time, I, I'm just dying to know what that feels like. And I know that going to space is going to change me forever. And I want to know in, in what ways. And the only way I'll get the answers to these questions is going to be going to space. Do you, when you come back, have you thought about how this is going to change your career? In other words, do you envision, you know, going back and getting yet another science-related degree? Or do you, uh, what, what do you, how do you envision this is going to change your life? I have my dream job, and I have been wanting to be a PA at St. Jude for the past 19 years since I was treated here. And so now that I have my dream job, I'm holding on to this. And, you know, I think I'll be able to use my experiences um, of going to space to, to talk to my patients about it. And this mission is already giving my patients so much hope because they're all telling me they want to be astronauts now. And I love when they say that because not only are they thinking about growing up, but also achieving dreams and knowing that they can do anything they want. And so I think it's just it's my responsibility to come back and continue sharing this with these kids. That's just fantastic. OK, back to you, uh, Dr. Chancellor Serena. Um, having spent so much time on orbit, 
and having the background you do, what is the biggest question that you still have that you would like answered, specifically about uh, how we can use space to advance uh, the medical frontier in some way? So I, I, honestly, I'd like to know, you know, how much can we expand the use of the International Space Station of this beautiful orbiting laboratory to accomplish as much science as possible? You know, when we were up there in orbit, our day is mapped out to five minute increments because we're trying to perform so much science at one time. And I was trying to picture if we had 10 people or 12 or 15 or folks that you're bringing up from private companies just for a month at a time, which we're gonna start doing, how much could we achieve then? We just need people, people power, space and time. And I think our output could be phenomenal from ISS. Serena, any advice you might offer to Haley before she heads off on this mission? Yeah, Tom, thanks. Thanks for letting me answer that. I, I kind of wish I would have heard some of this before I started training and I did partway through so it helped. But Haley, what I would tell you is, you know, your mission is just it's, it's actually a very, very small part of the journey you're about to embark on and the training leading up to it, the people you meet, the people you get to interact with, the folks that you were that you will inspire even before launching is huge. Take advantage of that. Just enjoy every moment. Certainly the launch, the mission, the landing are going to be awesome. And then afterwards, it's it's really your responsibility, your duty to take that mission forward for as many years as you can to inspire as many people as you can. And Haley, any question that you may have or questions for uh, Serena? Um, well, right now we're working on our packing list. And so I think the biggest question on all our minds is what should we bring to space? <laughs> Yeah, um, I loved uh, bringing pictures of my family. Certainly, I had you know special necklaces with th things that my husband gave me that I carried that was very special to me and kept close to my heart. And I'll tell you the fun thing that I brought, and I'm so glad I did. And I handed it off to the next crew. Was my back scratcher? It was awesome. Oh, okay. <laughs> did not think of that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You guys are terrific. Hey, thank you both. You were a great, fascinating conversation. And Haley, wishing you well. We're going to be watching closely over the coming months. Thank you. You bet. Uh, and thank you for watching. Again, I'm Tom Costello with NBC News in Washington. This has all been a part of the NBC Universal News Group's partnership with the 2021 Aspen Ideas Health Festival. Uh, and if you'd like to watch it again, you can hit the rewind button or invite your friends to watch it. For now, I'm Tom Costello, NBC News in Washington. Driving healthcare innovation during the COVID pandemic is the subject of our next conversation, featuring Arpa Garay, president of Global Pharmaceuticals, Commercial Analytics and Digital Marketing at Merck, and Taryn Grohm with Pharma Voice. Hi, I'm Taryn Grohm, co-founder and editor of Pharma Voice, and I'm here with Arpa Garay, President, Global Pharmaceuticals, and Analytics, and Digital at Merck. One of the silver linings for the pandemic has been an increase in innovation. How has Merck innovated on behalf of patients, customers, and our third stakeholder, employees? Thank you, Taryn, and it's great to be here as well. Um, 10 questions in 10 minutes, so I'll get right into it. Uh, for patients, I'd say the biggest innovation that we're really excited about is on the clinical side and really trying to see if there's a treatment option with uh, molnupiravir to really help curb the pandemic for people who have been infected with COVID and or exposed with COVID. From a customer perspective, I'll say there's been a tremendous amount of innovation at scale in terms of leveraging different digital technologies um, and different ways to communicate with and educate um, our customers about different programs that we have. And from an employee perspective, I'd say it's been, it's been truly game changing. We've got a set of employees that have to be in the manufacturing sites and or the labs. Uh, we've put in a lot of new protocols to ensure their health and safety. Um, for those who can work from home, there's been a big focus focus on work-life balance, on technology, on um, different ways of engaging and collaborating. Um, so a whole new way of working on the employee front that I think uh, is probably here to stay for a little bit longer. I agree with you. Let's dig into a little bit more about that leveraging of data and technology. How are, what are some of the top ways Merck is doing this to better serve patients? 
Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, from a patient perspective, I'd say it's really across the value chain. Um, we're looking at um, you know, how to leverage data and technology to better recruit patients into clinical trials. We're thinking about how we leverage real world evidence um, to shape clinical trial design and accelerate potentially um, new data or uh, development of products. We're thinking about how we better diagnose and identify patients who could benefit from our products, um, how to show the value of our products uh, across healthcare systems to get better access for patients, um, you know, different ways of supplying our products to patients at new sites of care. And then last but not least, you know, really leveraging data and technology to think about how we can support patients who are on our therapies to get the most out of them through, you know, better compliance and adherence um, as, as, they're, as they're managing their disease. Excellent. You know, one of the silver linings of COVID-19 has that it has accelerated the pace of clinical development. But is this sustainable for the long term? Yeah, this is uh, this is a really interesting question. You know, I think there are some aspects uh, that we've learned from the pandemic around how we can accelerate, whether it's development or manufacturing, right, through public and private partnerships. Um, on the other hand, what we've also learned is in many of the examples where it feels that there's been significant acceleration, these are technologies and or molecules that have, have, have been studied for a number of years. So I think there are some opportunities where we can sustain acceleration. I think in other areas where we're truly looking at new molecular entities, um, that clinical development pathway is still going to take um, you know, quite a bit longer than maybe what, what we expect coming out of the pandemic with, with the new vaccines and some of the new um, therapies that have been launched during this time. What excites you the most about Merck's potential contribution of Malnupir Avir to the COVID-19 therapeutics arsenal? Yeah, so what excites me the most is um, a couple things. First and foremost, it's an oral treatment. It's a five-day pill that you take twice a day. Um, and really the hope is that um, for anyone who's infected with COVID-19, this short you know, convenient therapy can help them actually prevent serious complications, prevent hospitalizations, um, and really help not only the individual and the family, but but help curb sort of um, the rapid increase um, in, the, in the capacity constraints that we're seeing around the world. Um, in addition to that, we're also really excited about studying it in um, what we're calling the, the PEP setting, which is post-exposure prophylaxis. So if you are part of a community or a family setting where you've been exposed, uh, we're also looking to study it in that setting to see if it can prevent you from actually acquiring COVID-19. So I think, you know, both with the oral treatment, the short course of action, um, there's a lot we can do to really help curb this pandemic. Excellent. And another one of those silver linings of the pandemic is that over the course of the last 18 months, there's been an increase in the number and types of collaborations across the industry. How do you think this will play out in the future? Yeah, this is, um, I think this could be uh, one of those turning points that we look back on. Um, from a partnership perspective, you know, I've personally always been extremely passionate about partnerships as a way to go within healthcare. Healthcare is complex, healthcare is personal. Um, and, you know, for me, as I think about the pandemic, there's been a lot of different types of partnerships. There's clearly been the public-private partnership, uh, which which we've, we've talked a lot about in the media. There's been uh, the, the large pharma partnership, right, with Merck and J&J &J to help accelerate manufacturing uh, for the betterment of, of society. Um, there also have been a lot of other partnerships around alternate sites of care, right, whether it's getting vaccines in a different place um, or whether it's lab companies partnering with telehealth providers um, to help that patient experience. So when somebody finds out they're positive, they've got that immediate access. So I think this whole notion of partnerships across the value chain is here to stay. Um, and I do think, you know, with all of us being really focused on what's best for patients, what's best for communities, what's best for countries, um, and what's best for systems, you know, we can really do a lot more uh, together. I think it's an exciting time, as you said. I think this is, a, this is here to stay. Um, COVID has also illuminated the need for better health equity. How is Merck working toward addressing this issue? Yeah. So. I would say, you know, from a, a corporate perspective, this is a really important priority for all of us to really get after our mission of helping to save and improve lives around the world, right? Regardless of background or socioeconomic status. Um, I'd say first and fo foremost, um, more broadly, we're always taking an approach to see how we can maximize access to our therapies around the world. 
Um, and then within that, as we think about COVID specifically, we've been working really hard to create um, very clear principles around allocation, right? So um, our principles around allocation are driven by public need and population health need. Uh, first and foremost, over things like, you know, socioeconomic status or willingness to pay. So we have taken a very sort of close look at this topic um, all the way from the CEO down to make sure that we're, we're broadening um, our equitable access. And we're also studying the populations, as are many populations that just have not had access to testing or treatment or care. Um, and we've got a group really diving into, um, you know, social determinants of health and health equities around the world. So we're partnering closely together. This is a priority for us. Um, it's never easy, but it is something that we, we take very seriously. Kudos to you all and, continue, and good luck in continuing on that great work. Um, now let's shift gears a bit. What are the three biggest areas AI and machine learning can generate in terms of value in healthcare? Yeah, so that, um, so from my perspective, I, I would say it's across the entire value chain. Uh, you asked me for three areas. If I had to pick three, I'd say it's drug discovery, it's commercialization of our products, um, and it's supply chain. Because we're in rapid fire, why do you think the healthcare industry is behind other industries in adopting these technologies? So I think it's a couple of things. We're highly regulated. We've got a big focus on safety and patient safety, um, which creates a little bit of risk aversion in cultures. Um, and I'd say third is probably um, we're just catching up on the talent and technology front. Excellent. Um, a more tech-enabled world, speaking of the talent front, requires different skills and different perspectives. What do companies need to do to address their HR pipelines? Yeah, I, that's, you know, this is a key priority for me as well is, you know, attracting diverse talent from different industries, different backgrounds, different parts of the world um, that really have these skill sets and digital and data and analytics, so whether it's data scientists or data engineers. We're really looking broadly and differently at the talent that we need for the future versus the talent that we've had in the past to make it successful. Last question, and I'm going to put you on the spot. What is the next big thing that is going to change the healthcare industry? Um, I, I, I'll wrap it up with data. I think data is the new currency, whether it's our clinical data, whether it's real world evidence, or whether it's our customers' data, it's all going to be about data. Arpa, that was terrific. It's a lot to unpack there, but great information. Thanks so much. Thank you, Taryn. And now Aaron Huey from Amplifier demonstrates the power of art in communicating important public health messages and explains how you can download and share this kind of art in your own community. My name is Aaron Huey. I am the founder and creative director of Amplifier. Amplifier is a nonprofit design lab that builds art and media experiments to amplify movements. Uh, and movements can be pretty broadly defined when we look at like this moment in time that we're in with the coronavirus pandemic, with the need for vaccinations. This is absolutely a movement moment because it's an opportunity to save lives and we are actively fighting mis- and disinformation campaigns uh, with this work. The reason for Amplifier's existence, you know, in the beginning was that powerful visual storytelling in like photography and journalism and the way that we normally consume it can only do so much or I was seeing limitations in that. But really powerful art can literally stop people in the streets and make them want to ask questions. And that's what this art does. Like it, it lives there as a compass pointing to where we want to go. It's there, the signposts. You know, in, in, the, in the very beginning of this, the opportunity was to literally help save lives. And so to do that, uh, you have to talk about public health and safety, like literally what to do how long to wash your hands, talk about masks, talk about social distancing. You know, if we remember back to the very beginning, having to understand the rules around that. Uh, you know, how do we stay safe and how do we protect essential workers and doctors? So a lot of it too was, for a lot of people, a tribute to the people that were the first responders, um, to the doctors, to the nurses, to essential workers that were delivering our groceries and continuing to do the work that if they didn't take those risks, our world would stop. 
but then there's also whole other trajectories, like looking at the mental health fallout that's come from this pandemic, there are a lot of people isolated and alone and struggling with what to do. So we, we asked for a lot of submissions on the topic of well-being uh, and mental health and self-care because people needed to see messages that kind of kept them believing that could be those signposts that le saying, you know, there is a better future is coming. It's okay, like, let's be patient. It's coming, you know, it's okay to feel this way. The really special thing about launching a global open call and inviting the whole world to submit is that we see visions for storytelling that we could have never imagined ourselves. One of the most exciting parts of this open call also was that we had the opportunity between the two open calls to give out $200,000 uh, in grants to artists. Uh, so all of the work that was chosen by the curators was given uh, $1,000 a piece. For a lot of artists, the pandemic meant uh, a pause in work. We had work coming in from all over Africa and South Asia and uh, parts of the world we had never seen submissions where a thousand dollar artist award was a huge deal. And so it was exciting to be able to offer that opportunity to artists in places that, that we had never worked before. So really the, the pande this pandemic campaign has opened Amplifier up to more and more of an international vision Part of the foundation of what we do at Amplifier is that everything is free and open source. Everything we've ever made and ever commissioned uh, is available at amplifier.org as a free download. And, and then it can be anywhere, really. We've seen this as murals on the side of buildings. We've seen uh, light projections, massive light projections. Uh, you see it in the windows of coffee shops. You see it literally, in, you see it in the halls of hospitals. Uh, people made yard signs out of it. Uh, really, once the work is made, we distribute it in a way that anybody can use it anywhere. The way you carry it determines what kind of a tool it is. Like, you are the amplifier. I hope you would agree that today's presentations have been fascinating and enlightening, but we also hope that you have been inspired to take what you have learned and share it with others. Coming up tomorrow, beginning at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, conversations with those making a difference in medicine and health. Walter Isaacson talks with Nobel Prize winner Dr. Jennifer Doudna about CRISPR, the gene editing tool that promises breakthrough treatments and even cures, but also raises difficult moral questions. That's for tomorrow. For today, be sure to rejoin us at 4 p.m. Eastern Time for our first deep dive session on structural racism in medicine, what it is and what must be done about it. The expert panel moderated by MSNBC correspondent and Into America podcast host, Tremaine Lee, includes author and medical ethicist, Harriet Washington, Dr. David Williams of the Harvard School of Public Health, and Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, chair of the Biden administration's Health Equity Task Force. Again, check your email for the links or follow the directions on your screen to tune in. Thanks for joining us at Aspen Ideas Health, presented by the Aspen Institute in partnership with NBC Universal News Group. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Torres. The Aspen Institute provides thought-provoking and groundbreaking discussions week after week and has since 1949. Those ideas belong in the minds of curious and engaged people around the world, but we need your support to get them there. Please consider donating to help us develop, execute, and share innovative ideas like the ones you've heard today. Every day at 4 p.m., we'll be having a live deep dive into a variety of subjects with some of the top health and medical experts in the world. Tune in for more big ideas. From all of us at the Aspen Institute, have a happy, healthy rest of your day. All the best.